Hello! Welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of Twitch Broadcast Game Guru, your host Lee Bamba, the unlive, unrehearsed, absolute waste of time for anyone that knows Game Guru backwards. For those who want to explore the inner crannies of it, well, you may pick up a pearl from time to time by listening to all 55 live broadcasts, which should take away many hours of your life. But if you're willing to sit through it, then maybe you'll learn something. And if you don't learn anything, maybe you get entertained by something, even if it's one of my catastrophic mistakes. Now, as I said last week, I ran out of time really because it was a half an hour session, and I am yet attempting that holy grail of live broadcast, which is to get everything I want to say said in 30 minutes. So I have 26 minutes according to the clock in order to do that. And last week I wanted, hoped I would be able to show you how to speed up your Game Guru sessions um, in addition to the other thing I was showing. And so now we have a whole 20 minutes to do that. Now it's not going to be rocket science, it's not going to be some mystical art, it's really just some sensible things that I do in order to accelerate my frame rate, in order to ensure that I get a great um, gameplay and editing experience. Now, there's no magic formula to this. If you've got a vastly superior graphics card, you don't really need to do any of these techniques. It will already be very, very fast. If you've got a super fast CPU, like an 8-core uh, processor, and that running your entire system, and then just making Game Guru back heal, that's also going to be the other solution. But for those who are on low to mid spec systems who want every advantage they can get, then I have a few ideas and I can put them in front of you and maybe they'll be useful. Maybe they'll be mostly inconvenient. Um, but I'm going to say anything that I can think of anyway and it's a live chat session. I can see a chat window and another window. In video land you can't see but I can see the chat window and if I've missed anything out I am sure members of our small but select community who join us every week faithfully religiously might be able to suggest other optimization techniques that I may have missed and during the next 25 minutes I will be entertaining questions so if you have any questions about this or Game Guru or anything just stick a question mark at the end of your sentence and I'm sure to spot it so um, about five seconds before this Twitch broadcast started, I had a quick peek into my Steam folder and noticed that I was running a debug version of the Steam version of Game Guru, which explains why last week there was um, a crash out for seemingly no reason. Well, there was a reason. I was using a 38 megabyte um, version of Game Guru, which was, was, was debug, which means it was slow and it was hard. Had I not caught that then, you would have seen an... Uh, <laughs> oh, that's not very fast, is it? Because it would be running the debug version, everything would run slow. So I did a last minute delete off file, then a Steam Verified updated the file, so I'm back to 15 meg, super fast, super slick, executable, um, which would be that one here, 15411, is the one you need. That's going to be a nice, fast executable. So where to begin? How do you make your games fast? Well, I'll show you some simple things, okay? And then we'll just work our way out of this sort of rat's nest that I have created for myself. You're going to have a start position, and you're going to have, say, a game of scenery. So we'll have some buildings. So we'll pop in a structure. It's just called structure. We, it's our very first building we ever did for Game Guru. So just pop that in there. And because I kind of have an int, uh, and I know what I'm going to do in the near future, I'm going to add some other things down, and they'll all become apparent very, very soon. Clean slab, 100 by 100, go to press B for a snap mode, and then B again for a 100, 100 grid mode. Hold down shift, and then I'm going to drop in some of these things. Essentially, all they are is just flat floor slabs, but they're generally about 100 by 100 by 100. Well, I requested 100 by 100, but the artist sort of took liberties and made like 97, 97, 97, and <laughs> then they don't exactly line up. But it's pretty easy to get one out there in the asset line that is 100, 100, 100. Anyway, 
I digress. You notice they're all red, so they're all static. That's important. If this first tip I can give you is if and were possible when you're adding entities to your scene, add them in static mode because as soon as you light map it, it grabs them all, lumps them all into one great big geometry mesh and it does it as one draw call. So it's a re really fast way of rendering scene geometry. What you don't want is to do what I just did with this. It's green. Because then those are all dynamic. So they're going to have physics, they're going to have separate draw calls for every single one. Pretty horrid. So without further ado, not least because there'll be people We've not seen Game Guru before. Maybe this broadcast 50 whatever is the very first Twitch broadcast they're viewing. So we shouldn't bore them too much, shall we? So now we're going to build that game. Not much of a game. It's really just some scene. So those are building we added. Those are static floor tiles and those are dynamic ones. They're pretty heavy. So I will be able to push those. They're pretty heavy slabs. But these are the ones that I meticulously... And you see... You know, you're going to have to either raise the building or lower these slabs. And the reason they're not exactly 100-100 is they were sort of slightly beveled here. So, But they do, as you can see, they do form a nice uniform grid if that's the sort of thing you wanted for your games. Now, what am I talking about in terms of performance optimization? Well, let's just start with the tab-tab panel. So, we'll press tab-tab, which is the tab key, press twice. And you'll see all these wonderful things. Now, I'm just going to look at our FPS. It's running at uh, something very yucky, um, 63, 64. Um, now, don't worry too much about my FPS. Remember, I'm running a broadcast system, so half of my computer is now dedicated to screen scraping, compressing it down, sending it online so you can re watch it live so my frame rate isn't going to be sort of the true fps that i normally see but you can run through the same techniques that i'll demonstrate and you'll get those fps improvements and we may even see here as well but don't count on oh it jumped up to 114 hooray something stopped happening in the background not my background windows you know, well, back in the days of the old Amiga, you didn't have many background tasks messing things up. But Windows have a wonderful habit of loading as much stuff in the background and running that at equal or greater priority than the stuff that's filling the whole screen. Don't complain to me, complain to Microsoft. So first thing I'm going to do is set these shader options all to lowest. Now remember, this is my brutal um, walkthrough of how to make more and more speed. So if you are running on a mid to low range graphics card, setting these to lowest, you will get some performance improvement. You can also switch the water reflections off because reflections are quite intense. They actually render the scene twice, possibly even three times. So switching that off is a great thing to do. Shadows are quite intensive as well. They actually suck up a lot of processor because they also render things up to four times. It has a camera up in the sky that renders the scene at four different sort of distance levels. So that's four additional renders. You don't see it, you just get to see a nice shadow. But the shadows are actually quite intense because of the number of renders they do. Light rays are off by default, but again, that's another render. Vegetation, that adds lots of polygons to the scene. So if your graphics card is the kind of graphics card that's already maxing itself out, rendering the polygons it's already got on the screen, but then you've got a lot of grass and vegetation, this slider here, this really does ramp up the number of polygons used for grass. So you can bring that right down to a point where you only need to see a little bit grass near where the camera is, and then it just fades it out as it gets further away. Keep occlusion at 100%, that was fixed now, so occlusion runs on a separate thread, so it actually calculates what does it need to be rendered in the scene, and then hides those before it even gets to the draw call stage. So that's a pretty good feature. I'm quite happy to recommend them keeping that at 100%. So we're going to knock shadows off, we're going to knock vegetation off. All these are set to lowest. Forget distance transitions and transition ranges. There isn't really a performance gain to be had there. No real performance gains in terms of terrain, but if you pick a terrain with a smaller texture set, so something like um, Cartoon, it uses much smaller textures, less GPU video memory, therefore a faster throughput on some of your caches, and you'll get a few extra FPS. 
Um, so you see I've jumped up to 88. Um, it, it'll jump back down to 63 and then up to 110. So you can't really use this number as a as a benchmark because I'm broadcasting as well as I said before. Similarly with uh, the vegetation, if you're using a veg that's a very low texture, then you'll save a few microns of performance. This is another good one, terrain lods. So forget the lod near, medium and far. Those are really deciding the level at which they will transition. Texture size is more important. If you knock that down to zero, you notice what just happened then with the horizon. It's up there, and now it's there, now it's up there. Doesn't seem like you've got a lot of visual change on the screen right now, but basically you're cutting quite a lot out. Look at the polygon count now. It's probably a better statistic than pointing you to the FPS. It's using 272,000 polygons. You draw a triangle on a piece of paper, that's one polygon. This scene is using 272,000 set of those triangles. If we change range size to zero, that goes down to 141. So you've effectively halved the number of polygons that you're asking your graphics card to render. Vegetation quantity. Uh, quantity is related to the vegetation slider. This actually decides how many grasses you see on the screen at once. And this is how many you cram within that sort of area. You could almost call it vegetation density. So reducing that to zero would also, if you've got that vegetation at eight and then vegetation quantity at say two, then you'll get sort of a good spread off to the distance up to a vegetation of eight, but then it would use grass every now and again, just little pockets of it. At levels this low, you might find it easier just to stick vegetation in as static entities. Um, and that's for you to experiment with combination of using the built-in vegetation system and then plonking in little incidental vegetations. So that's something to bear in mind. Of course, width and height, the individual height and width of grasses. Camera distance is sort of similar to terrain size. If we ramp terrain size back up to 100 and then bring camera distance down, what that's actually doing is imposing what's called a camera clip. And it's clipping it on the Z distance. So as you can see, I can clip even more out. Now the problem with camera distance, yes it does, it saves performance, but it doesn't stop the draw calls. It's still drawing as many, many polygons as you saw before, but after it gets to the point where it's processed all the geometry, located the vertices, and figured out where the polygons go on the screen, then there's a process which says, right, now don't draw any pixels, beyond a particular Z depth, beyond a certain distance from the camera. So effectively you're not hassling the pixel shader. And the saving there is um, because you're not running the pixel shader logic, you can skip it early, which means the graphics card has less to do on the pixel shader side, and that will again give you a performance boost. But obviously you can't run around your game like this. I mean you could do if it was a horror game and you kept it like really dark. Um, then yeah, you could have a really um, spooky game. That was your draw distance. A few commercial games have tried it, like Turok Dinosaur Hunter, but I think everyone was agreed when they said it wasn't a particularly good experience because you'd be walking around and then the big dinosaur would come out of the fog and bite your head off. So you really want to find design your level and then try to find a nice sweet spot for camera distance. If you can cut off a few more pixels towards the distance, um, all the better. But remember, pixel shaders really only kick in at sort of that pixel level. So if you've uh, only got a little bit of the screen that's actually benefiting from uh, those pixel shaders and then you cut them out, you know, you got to look at all the pixels on the screen to realize how much what the pixel shader is doing and how much you can cut off by changing the slider. So I just put it to about there just for fun. Um, forget about this, that's nothing to do with performance, nor is that, nor is that. Going on to post effects, yes, you'll have a lot of benefits here by playing around with these values. And just to move on quickly to the visual settings, none of those things on the visual settings panel will affect your performance, really. It just affects what the pixel shaders are going to do with the final geometry that you dumped onto the screen. So forget visual settings, look at post effects. Um, Bloom is a huge saving. For example, um, we're at 64 now. If I show you FPS on its own, 
295 FPS. Oh, just a little... Uh, when you're playing with these set settings and you notice that you're not getting any speed up whatsoever, notice it's 64 FPS here. That's not because that's the game speed, uh, your game speed is. It's because all these panels and all the sort of extra stuff that runs in tab-tab mode sucks your frame rate. It really does suck it dry. Your true frame rate is when you're playing the game, but you can't see it. If you press tab once, you get to see just the metrics panel with all that extra debug stuff not happening. And so that's the true FPS that we're getting now, 304, 305. If I switch Bloom off, and then look at it again, it's now 540 FPS. An extra 200 FPS. That is significant. Why is it significant? Well, the Bloom slider is largely responsible for a post-process effect. So with Bloom off, you're basically just seeing the, the back buffer rendered. That's it. Back buffer rendered. If you want all the clever, lovely visuals that you get in nice graphics cards, you're going to have to pay for it with GPU cost. And when you ramp this up, then you can see this bloom effect, which is washing out the scene, that's a post-process effect. That means the graphics card is rendering the scene three, five, seven, nine, twelve times. Not the whole geometry, just that quad. The size of the screen rendered five or seven or nine or twelve times. Um, and by switching bloom off, you switch off a lot of the other little effects like light rays doesn't really do much. You know, light rays really needs the post-process to do stuff. If Bloom is off, it's the fastest. If Bloom is on and then you've switched uh, motion blur off and depth of field off and SAO intensity off, then um, you're going to get the, the, the fastest, uh, the, sort of the next fastest because it's actually using a different post process shader. It says, well, you want Bloom, but you don't want the SAO and you don't want the motion blur. If you, if you Watch now, and I switch SAO on. You see, it goes from that 600 nod back down to 314. You see, or the 500 to 314. That's because the SAO, the depth of field, and the motion blur, and the bloom, all sort of cumulatively add a drain because it's all happening in that post process shader. So, playing around with bloom. Depth of field, motion blur, and SAO, you can have a nice sweet spot and you can look for those frame rates that you get the best of the visuals that you want, or rather the ones that you absolutely must have with an, an agreeable FPS. But that's not all. I mean, I could t talk more about the nuances of that, but I'll start boring you with shaders and you probably won't want to hear that at all. But that's really sort of the high view of what all these different sliders could do to improve your frame rate. Something else that you might be interested in We'll uh, let's go for gold. Let's switch bloom off. So we've already got 539 FPS. Plenty for most games. And look, I'm running around, but then I've got a pretty decent graphics card. So this is not an atypical example. What I want to show you is the F11 mode. If you press F11 from the game, you get this. Now you noticed uh, at the bottom we've got terrain, water guns, Elmos, sky physics, AI grass, and entity. You notice water is in capitals, that means it's deactivated. Um, why is it deactivated? Well, I'll show you. Remember when we dialed water reflections to zero? Well, it automatically removed the water plane and stopped all the reflections. So, what the F11 is actually showing you is the different groups of geometry that's been rendered to the screen. And because the water has been disabled, you notice in the F11 paddle, it's acknowledging that, and so you don't actually see, you know, the water is, for all intents and purposes, disabled. And we're at 500 FPS. I've left the FPS on because this is a panel you can experiment for your frame rate. Now, if you have terrain off, because terrain is a big chunky uh, bunch of geometry and pixel shader stuff is, it goes from 500 to 714 FPS because now you don't need to render the terrain. Now, I imagine some of you are saying, well, what the point is that? Why switch your terrain off? Your game looks stupid now. Well, it wouldn't look stupid if you was inside buildings all the time. Or when you went outside, you was in a cloud city. And so now all your static entities that we remember we placed down earlier for some mysterious reason, now it makes a lot of sense. So you can make your game just out of static entities and interior spaces. And then if you're in a cloud city or you've got sort of, you're high up, 
you know, you on a skyscraper, then suddenly this skybox makes a little bit more sense. You know, can we jump to that one? I'm not even going to try. The collision for the terrain is still there. It's just the geometry has been switched off, which is what the F11 mode is all about. So if we had a gun and press 3, it would switch the gun off. If we had any light mapping objects, it would switch those off with 4. 5 switches the sky off, as you see, there's no sky now, but now we've gained another 100 FPS. I can switch physics off, but now I can't move anywhere, so we really do want physics. Switch AI off, if there's any enemies running around. If there's any grass, we can switch that off. And in entities, which is the one we're standing on now, remember, we don't mess about with the collision, we're just changing the geometry. If I switch 9 off, get rid of the floor and the building entity and everything. And now we're looking at... 1,312 FPS, and all we're really doing is clearing a back buffer, running a really low uh, low power post process effect, and rendering some text to the screen. And of course, in the background, you've got your game loop, your game logic, your physics, um, any sort of collision bits, any sort of entity logic and scripting. All that's still going on. I am not just rendering a blank screen because otherwise 1,321 FPS would be considered quite low. But the rest of the game is running and ticking along nicely. We just switched everything off. And one of the things, the big things, my big piece of advice is, if you want lots of frame rate in your game, don't draw loads of things. Try and find reasons to not draw stuff. Come up with techniques where you don't have to draw as much of everything. Um, if that is your single trick on how to speed up your game, you'll not go far wrong. You really won't. Because it ultimately is up to you what you draw. I mean, I've drew all these individual entities, but there been, you know, there's a lot of draw calls here. I mean, I'll give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. If I go to the tab panel, and I step back a little bit, I'm looking at 158 draw calls. So there's some sky, there's some terrain, there's a building, there's some of these cube things. But I'm looking at 158 draw calls. Now if I go to the simplest one, which is F1, which essentially is light mapping with no lights, just the sun, uh, but it wants to conglomerize all the individual meshes that have the same texture. So you see how it's just grabbing huge, huge chunks of those entities, it's going to try and stitch them together as best it can. And now you've got draw calls of 60. That's a third of the draw calls we was having before. It also has the benefit that it's pre-baked the lighting into the geometry. So you don't have to do as many lighting calculations. And if we switch over to just the tab, now we've got 660 FPS. Everything still works, collision. In some respects, light mapping is a better lighting trick. I mean, that's relatively low quality, but you can actually increase the quality and the density of how much sort of texture space the light mapper has. So you can have a lot of fun with that. So that's just a really quick introduction into how the light mapper will batch geometry and have less draw calls. And again, on a low to mid graphics card, those you know, third saving or a two third saving on draw calls will reflect a lot of FPS in your direction. Um, so that's really the FPS in terms of reducing drawing stuff, you know, drawing less so you can actually get more FPS out of your game. Uh, this demonstration would probably look a lot better if I was on, say, um, a graphics card that maybe only scored about 800 or 1000 on Passmark. But I think my graphics card scores about 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. So it's not really a fair demonstration of how these techniques can vastly increase frame rate. Because I don't think I've ever dropped below uh, 200 or 300 when it was just in this mode. You can't really take that loop. How can you go from 600 to 64? That's because this tab tab mode deliberately slows you down. You really want to use tab. A better way to look at your frame rate is to just do F11 and then F11 again. And now you're really just running around your game and all it's rendering, it's not rendering sliders or bars, it's just your frame rate. Very useful if you just want to play a game, but if you want to keep an eye on the FPS but not have it intrude, then that's the best way to do that. Now I did say this was a live session, I also said it was 30 minutes long and we've got 3 minutes left. And I do want to do justice to people who have asked this question, so I'm going to go to the boards and I'm going to look at some questions. So I'll just go back into the chat window. Um, and has anybody used GameGuru on a NAS drive by Wi-Fi? <laughs> 
NAS drive by Wi-Fi. GameGuru was not designed to run over a network. I can, I'm pretty categorical in that. Why I don't run stuff over a network, it's chug slow. Um, file accesses are ridiculously slow and everything can freeze and freezing on a NAS drive access can be normal. So you really want to put yourself in an environment of speed and performance. Running anything off a NAS drive is not going to put you in an environment of speed and performance. Um, it's not necessarily how, how good the kit is in the NAS drive. It's really the toing and froing of all that data and all the network protocols to sort of simulate the act of working on files. It's pretty terrible. So um, I would highly recommend against running at GameGuru on, on a NAS drive or even accessing your game files over a NAS drive. You certainly use your NAS drive as a daily backup or um, a live backup which runs in the background. That's fine as long as it's low, uh, low impact and non-intrusive. But I certainly wouldn't use it to run from. It's scary stuff that. Um, I shall drop a question. This is from Honoros. Uh, is there a way to add more meters or slider bars in the options menu? No, they're all hard coded, created lovingly by myself. In the future, we are going to have something called Lua GUI. And those sliders are sort of a template for what they might look like or some of the things that you'll be able to see in Lua GUI. Given that, then, it would be probably quite simple and the next step to then migrate that into the editing experience and the test game experience so effectively you can create your own sliders that control your own shaders control your own properties within your entities or your scripts you'll be able to do that but that's when Lua, Lua GUI arrives I don't think it's on the voting board there are some things that hint toward it but then I'll put it up properly once the voting board has been reduced a little bit so look forward to that it's called Lua GUI and yes you'll be able to create your own sliders with it um, GD says dynamic floor tiles would be great for puzzle floors, I guess. Great for a maze, yeah. I mean, here's an example. If you had this static one removed, and then you put this one in its place, and then when you stood on it, you could have it hide and then switch its collisions off, you fall through the floor. And you can do that right now with script. So go on the forums, ask someone about it. Someone out there will absolutely know what I'm talking about and give you some advice on it. Uh, VRG has been getting a green screen for the half of the broadcast, I apologise, but it sounds like it's back on his desktop, so I'm really pleased. Uh, you'll be able to hear it uh, and see it, all 30 minutes of it, on a video. I'll be uploading it after this broadcast, so you can watch it in glorious pixels. Um, VRG asks, v is GG still single-core or multi-core? Well, it's multi-core. There's elements of it, like the light mapper will use every core you've got to speed up the process. The occluder runs entirely on its own thread. It grabs a whole core for itself in order to work out the occlusion so fast. It knows what's not going to be renderable before you actually even get to start the draw calls. It's pretty sweet. In fact, on a decent CPU, the occluder can run six times before the GPU has finished one sequence of drawing all the draw calls. And that's really because there's a lot of CPU bottleneck when you're trying to stack all these CP, uh, so GPU states updates. Um, it just shows how, how good it is to put something on a core and we put the occluder on the core. There are plans to put the AI on its own core as well. So you can have lots of enemies and it would just run nice and smooth. It'd be really good if we could put the lure on its own script as well, on its own core as well. So you could have massive scripts running at full speed. But lure scripts are slightly different because you kind of have a critical path. Script 1 has to run before script 2 runs, things like that. But if we said switch that off, you don't necessarily need that, then yeah, we could have a lot of fun adding stuff to cores. So I'd say we are multi-core, but we could be a lot better. So hopefully that answers the question. Retro Game Blow posts in with, I think it uses different um, cores for occlusion, but I don't think it goes much further yet. Yeah, that's pretty much the summary of it. It does a few things, but it could do a lot more. Certainly doesn't compare against, say, for example, the latest uh, Doom, which has been built from the ground up to use these little micro tasks. So um, there's hardly any sort of single sequence. Everything just runs in this great big quagmire of parallel processing, and it all meets up at the end, and it tends to work out very well. Um, but you really have to build an architecture from scratch. I could make it that, you know, this ultimate task scheduler engine, but then I'd have to kind of close down the shop 
for 18 months while I write that architecture and then I'll come back in two years with a new version of Game Guru that's multi-core. I'm not sure you want to wait two years just to see a slight speed improvement. I think you'd rather see lots of features and performance improvements in other areas during that two years with lots and lots of updates which is the direction I am preferring to go in so hopefully everyone agrees on that. Uh, Retro asks, is there any news on the update? No, there's no new screenshots, there's no new progress. It's really just a case of me continuing to work on the EBE to my satisfaction before I afflict the world with it. Um, I have been playing room with it, uh, but really I want to have a beta that, and there are some beta testers sort of itching at the fingers to get their hands on it, um, but I really only want to do the beta when I'm quite happy with how it's going to be. I don't want to backtrack. I don't want to release something and then either delete it and start again or backtrack half the way. I'd rather be very comfortable that that's what I want in Game Guru for the next two years and then the beta is really about does it break? Is there some glaring feature missing from it so then we can add to it and then use the beta process for that. Otherwise it will be in beta forever. And if you get enough people together and call it a democracy, there's absolutely no way you'll get 100% agreement on it. So it takes one person to say, this is the way it should be. And unfortunately, I'm the guy. So <laughs> uh, you're going to have to lump what it is I come up with. But I'm pretty happy with how it's working out so far. It has all the best flavours of the old FPS Creator Classic system, but it also has that future-proofness of being able to create lots of shapes and that ease of use so you can create both interior and exterior structures. And then it combines well with the existing interface so you don't really have to learn a lot of new tools. It pretty much fits nicely within what you're already using right now. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to giving you that in the next couple of weeks. Well, at least the beta testers in the next couple of weeks. It's a pretty monstrous thing adding an entire building editor into one's software. So hopefully you'll bear with me a while longer. Uh, oh, here we go. GD underscore ED says, I think you may have missed this one. Is there a way to make this default unloading game guru for these settings? Um, What, you mean the panels? Uh. I mean, you saw the settings that I just did, and I've come out of here. I'll click save, and then I'll come out. And, and you look at this visuals.ini. See all these? These are all the things that the editor retains. So this is all the stuff that the editor has said. Well, these are the. So you'll see that terrain four is lowest, entity three is lowest, edge agitation four is lowest. So those numbers actually equate to you know one is highest, two is high. 3 is medium, 4 is lowest, similarly with entities and things, but they have different descriptions for each of the numbers. So you see it's remembered those shader levels in this file, visuals.ini. So when I launch Game Guru, the first thing it does, it loads visuals.ini, it says, ah, these are the settings that you most prefer, because your graphics card is not capable of running ridiculous quantities of post-processing effect. So now in theory, we dropped in and we started a new project. Let's say we had a building, different one this time. Then a marker and then run that. I designed the software so that it remembers the visuals that I and I settings so that when you tab tab we should already be on uh, on the low settings. So I think we can call that a bug. <laughs> because that's what the visual that I and I does. It it remembers those early settings but what it does do I think maybe probably there was another feature request that says can you not restore them because I've messed all my features up so it could be I've had two feature requests that are not mutually exclusive and overwrote each other so when you leave the software and come back it restores those basic defaults um, I've noticed it switched bloom off so it's remembered that but it's restored the shader ones all to medium when we had them at lowest I think last time and uh, light, ma uh, light rays is set to zero. Remember water had reflections, now it's set to zero. So some things are retained. So you can leave and come back, some things are retained. But some things are not. So whether they're bugs or whether they're actually feature requests that have gone in. So when I go back to that same piece of code to say, all right, well, we'll restore these as well. I might find a little comment from myself from six months ago. It says, no, nope, there was many requests that these are set to medium. So I'll probably put it back. So if there is any feedback or any strong opinion in this area, uh, please do add it to the uh, 
forums is probably the best place so other people can comment on it. I don't really want to add a feature, then unadd it, then add it again, then unadd it for a second time. That would be a waste of my time. So once we've got community consensus on exactly how this should behave, then yeah, I can implement it or unimplement it as the case may be. Um, dup, dup, dup. So I think he means standalone default settings. All right. Well, um, that's the different one altogether. That if you go into a standalone game, uh, you would actually get setup.ini, which is all the settings that you'd start with. But inside the setup uh, standalone executable, you also have visual.ini. So you can actually set your defaults here. And there's another thing that you may not know about, actually, which actually speaks to this issue. Um, here it is. Game menu options. In the game standalone itself, you've got low, low medium, and high settings in the uh, menu, where you can actually change what those actually mean. Let's say you don't want any low settings in your game. You can change lowest to medium. So you can copy medium into the there and there. So now the lower medium are actually the same setting in your game. Or you can set medium to high and then set high to highest. So it's entirely up to you what you do with that. Now obviously using a notepad it only has one undo so I've just messed up my setup so I'm going to have to not save this. But that's what you can actually do in your standalone if you want to actually regulate what low, medium and high actually do. It's a little bit confusing that you've got low, medium, highest text there but up here well, not up there, in the other file, you've actually got one, two, three, four representing what each of these do. But one thing I was going to say that the visual INI is used for another thing as well. If you're actually in here and you set everything to low, um, okay, so we set them to low, and then you, uh, there you go, so they're all on lowest and then you come out and then go back in, they'll, be, they'll still be set to lowest. Whereas in the editor, they're not lowest. They're actually, it actually ramps up the shader quality a little bit, so the editor can have its shadows and its other little features. So the shader settings that you'll see in your game aren't necessarily the shader settings you see in the editor, which is why those settings are retained. So when you go back to test game, it retains those settings that you've actually applied. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we've got a question mark. Uh, I know it's gone past the 30 minute mark, but you know what? I'm always going to keep gabbing if there's still uh, questions on the live chat. It's only right. Uh, can you show me how I can delete light mapping from my levels? Mm, yes, it's easy. <sighs> but then everything becomes commonplace once explained. So right now we're looking at a real time shadow. I'll show you a real shadow. I'll show you it in good quality. So there's your nice little shadow. That's a real time one. If I press F2, that's basically the the quickest but um, almost fully function complete uh, light mapper. The quick one, it really just dials down all the quality so it can dump it out really quick. So it looks like a real time shadow. It's not. That's actually been baked into the uh, uh, the floor. There's some. Uh, light mapping actually adds a few geometries because there's some polygons now that are holding the shadow on the floor. You don't really see it, but there's actually two different polygons. There's one for the grass, which is the terrain in general, but then there's one that holds this shadow, which is a semi-transparent quad with a light map texture painted onto it. So your question is, how do I get it so it's real time again? Well, there's two ways you can do that. One, you can just go into tab, tab, shader options, lighting, and set it onto real time. So now we're actually on a real-time calendar and you can go back to pre-bake so now you're on pre-bake but what you probably want to know is how to get rid of the light mapping altogether well it's quite simple you press F1 wait till it goes to light mapper and then press when it shows up escape and now you've actually got rid of all the light map data because the first thing the light mapper does it deletes the old light mapping data and then it starts from scratch if you interrupt the process it's deleted the live mapping data, so it's not there anymore. Now remember, on pre-bake, so you deleted it, remember? If you go to real time, you'll get your, where it is, you get your building back, and you get your real time lighting back. If you go out, and you do save, and that, you'll be saving it without light mapping. So that's the way of removing the light map data. Just start the light map process, and then immediately cancel it out, and it wipes out the light mapping data. There's another more complicated way, which involves going into MapBank, picking the level we were talking about, 
um, renaming.fpm2.z, then extract it. The password is my password, and that extracts it as a folder. You can go in here, and if it had light maps, there would be a new folder called, well, it wouldn't be called that, called light maps. All you're going to do is delete the entire light maps folder, dink, then take all this, zip it up again. Remember, you've got to use the password because otherwise it won't recognize it. You can do it as a zip, set password, my password, OK. Click OK. It creates a zip, which is there. Bring it back out into the map bank, like so. And then finally, rename the zip back to an FPM. And now you'll be able to load that. Oops. Well, <laughs> if I didn't accidentally just press save, you would accidentally you would um, load it back in. And they would load it in without any hint of light mapping data. That's the hacky way of doing it. So, uh, wasn't intending to show that, but what a great little tip. If you were joining in on this broadcast, <laughs> you don't get to see that kind of hack every day. GDED asks, how do I get the left-hand menu in the editor back once clicking the close button without reloading Green Guru? Left-hand menu in the editor back once I click the close button without reloading Green Guru. Um, you don't. You have to reload Game Guru. This is a throwaway sort of feature that we wanted to play with. So you know, so you, you could customize it, so you could have it on that side of the screen and do all these. But we made a decision a while ago that we're really going to get away from this, um, this sort of Windows dropping down menus and things. Now it's not going to happen overnight, but essentially what it will be, you'll have all the better, the benefits of this, you'll still have all this, but you're not running under the Windows UI system. You'll actually be running under a proper 3D, you know, glossy, dark metal, semi-transparency stuff, which means you wouldn't just have these sort of static entities, you could hover over them and the building would rotate or maybe zoom in or have a shader on them and stuff like that. So a, a really enhancement to the IDE. So we're not really going to spend a lot more time working on what is a very antiquated version of a docking system. So we're not really going to have that. So there's no point doing any code in that area. So watch that space. I think it's quite low down on the uh, the voting board, but it's going to be a very exciting ad. Really transform the visuals of Game Guru. We're then going to expand it to include multi-monitor support, multi-window support, really clever, swanky 3D docking, and all that kind of cool stuff. But I think the most of the community do agree. Let's get the games great. Let's get more gameplay, more logic, faster performance, better looking graphics, more features, both in the editor and in the game. So I think we're all of one mind there, so that's what we're going to charge ahead and do. But it starts with the ability to create your own buildings rather than just drag them in from the store. So I have run across the 30 mile, uh, uh, thirty minute mile marker, but I don't really want to then waffle for the next 15 minutes. So I'm going to end it there. I hope I showed you a couple of little speed tips. Um, how you can actually get more performance really quickly when you're working on your games. Hiding that terrain I showed before isn't just a fancy feature of F11. You can actually have a command in Lua which actually switches it off. So right at the start of your game you can start inside a room. You can switch off the terrain immediately and instantly get that frame rate boost. So that's something you can do. And it's widely documented in the forums as well if you want to find that out. So until next week, it should be the same time. I don't think there's going to be any interruptions. So it's, it's Wednesday, it's 4 p.m. British summer time. I'll be here. I hope you'll be here. I hope you've enjoyed this little broadcast. And I'll see you all next week. So thanks for listening and watching. Bye.